appreciate you, brother. Good morning. How are we? Thank you, my brother. Anybody glad to be in church this morning? Come on. Come on. I may be a little biased, but it's a good morning to be in church. Can I get an amen? amen. I love your pastor, Pastor Vernon, and his wife. Aren't they, aren't they incredible? Come on, give, give them a hand. I know they're not here, but I love him. I'm so thankful for his faith, for his, uh, his ability to just dream. And uh, it's so cool to see this dream come to life. Has this church made an impact in anybody's life in the last year? Come on. It's good. Well, listen, I'm Nate. I'm from right here in Richmond. And my beautiful wife, Anna, she's with me. And we're so honored to be with you guys this morning. For the last two years, we've been traveling on the road full time, preaching all over the country with the goal of seeing people come to know Jesus. Anybody know and love Jesus today? Come on. And so it's such an honor for us to be here, and I'm excited for what God's going to do. I believe he's got a word for you this morning. That you're going to leave encouraged, that you're going to leave with your head held high, not in confidence in anything that you have going on, but a confidence in your God and who he is. And so I'm excited for what God's going to do this morning. If you have your Bible or your smartphone, go ahead and take it out. When I say smartphone, I mean iPhone. <laughs> Where are my Android people? You got an Android? Let me see your hand. We're going we gonna to pray for y'all after service. <laughs> Take out your Bible. Go to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. If you don't have it, we'll have some verses on the screen for you. But today, my whole goal, what I'd like to accomplish this morning is I want to answer a question. And the question that I want to ask is, can God really be trusted? Can, can God really be trusted? Because if we're being honest... The, the call to follow Jesus is a massive one. <laughs> you, you see all throughout the scriptures when Jesus calls people to follow him, it's not a call that affects Sunday morning and that's it. It's not a call that affects one part of your life but not the others. No, the call to follow Jesus actually affects every area of your life. It affects us every second of every day. It affects how you think, how you talk, how you work, how you handle relationships, how you handle finances, how you are in school and in your workplace. It affects everything. This call to follow Jesus is a massive one. It's, it's like diving into the deep end. Are you with me this morning? And if, if we are going to do that, if, if we are going to be people that follow Jesus with everything, I think a legitimate question for us to ask is, can I really trust God? If, if I'm going to give God my everything, how do I know I can really trust him? Because if we're being honest, our trust has been broken before. Anybody with me? You trusted someone or something, and it's gotten broken. Like all the Redskins fans. <laughs> Sorry. I went there. Like right now, you put hope and trust in them in a few months. Broken, right? Sorry. But th this happens, right? We trust things, and it gets broken. And because of that, we become hesitant to trust, and I think if we're not careful, we can become hesitant to trust God. And so I want to ask this morning and hopefully answer the question, how do we know God can really be trusted? And I want to read verse 23 from Daniel chapter 6. I want to show you why I chose this story. This is a story, it's a very popular one. You may have heard it before about Daniel getting thrown into the lion's den, and he gets tossed in the den, and he's not harmed, and the next day he's brought out of the lion's den completely whole, completely healthy, and here's what the Bible says in verse 23. I want you to see this. It says, when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him. He was whole, he was healthy, he was not harmed. And it says, because he had trusted in his God. He, he was not harmed, not because he had crazy faith, not because he fought off the lions, not because he had his act together that week. No, no, no. Daniel was not harmed because he trusted in his God. So th throughout this whole story, we're going to see what it looks like to trust God. And so I want to encourage us that we can trust God today. Are you with me this morning? Would you bow your heads and pray with me and then we'll get into the word. Jesus, we love you so much. Lord, we're so thankful for this opportunity you've given us to gather here this morning. Lord, and I thank you for your word. God, I thank you that it's not just an old book. God, it's not just words on a page, but it's your word. It's alive and it's active, and it can speak to and change our hearts this morning. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do what I cannot, and that's transform and change our hearts. Lord, what we do not need is another sermon or another church service. What we need is to hear from you. Lord, would you speak to us this morning? God, would we leave differently than we came in because of your word? 
and your Holy Spirit changing our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Everyone said? I want to look in verse 1 of Daniel chapter 6. Here's what the Bible says. It said, It pleased Darius, he was the king, to appoint 120 satraps to rule throughout the kingdom with three administrators over them, one of whom was Daniel. So Daniel is the man. Daniel works for the government, and the king liked Daniel. And so Daniel's one of the top guys. He's one of the top dogs working his way up in the government under King Darius. And here's what it says in verse 3. It says, Now Daniel, he so distinguished himself among the administrators and the satraps by his exceptional quality. Somebody say exceptional. exceptional. That the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. I love that Daniel had exceptional qualities, that he was gifted. Are you with me this morning? I love that our God is a good gift giver. Did you know God has given you good gifts? God has anointed you. God has given you gifts to use you in a mighty way. I'm so glad in the body of Christ all of our gifts are different. Are you with me? Like there's a reason I was not singing this morning. That is not my gift. But I'm so thankful for my brothers that are. Are you with me? Come on. God gives gifts to his people. I love how God gifts and uses People. And in the body of Christ, we don't use our gifts to glorify ourselves or to build our own platform. We use our gifts as a mirror to reflect and show people who Jesus is. Are you with me? We get to use our gifts to serve God and to serve kingdom purposes. Our gifts are bigger than our, ourselves when we use them for kingdom purposes. And I love the Bible says Daniel, he was gifted. He was gifted. He was set apart and God was using him. And because of that, it said the king planned to set him over the whole kingdom. This is promotion day for Daniel. This is a good day for Daniel. God is using Daniel in a great way. He has gifted him, and not only has he gifted him, but Daniel is using and walking in his giftings, and he's about to get promoted over the entire kingdom. But here's what the next verse says, the beginning of verse 4. It says, at this, the administrators and satraps tried to find grounds for charges against Daniel and his conduct of government affairs. How many know when God is doing a work in your life and when you are following Jesus, not everyone will be your number one fan? <laughs> Did you know this? Not everyone will be your biggest cheerleader. In fact, Jesus says you will face opposition. <laughs> says it, it will get hard. Not everyone will be for you. You will have to swim upstream in this walk with Jesus. But I'm so glad that we don't do it alone. We do it with the God that lives in us and is with us, right, and has called us. So you have Daniel... He's called, he's moving up, but these other guys, they don't like it, and it says that they try to find grounds for charges against him. They begin to dig through his dirt, they begin to look through past business that he has done in government affairs, and they're trying to find corners Daniel has cut to bring him down. They're trying to find times where Daniel was dishonest so they can bring him down. They're trying to find moments where Daniel lacked integrity so they can bring him down. They're trying to find something in the life of Daniel to tear him down. And here's what the scripture says. I love it. In the second half of verse 4, it says, but they were unable to do so. They could find no corruption in him because he was trustworthy and neither corrupt nor negligent. I love that when they looked at Daniel, they saw he was someone, he was a man of integrity. He, he was a man that was the same in front of people and behind closed doors. He was somebody that didn't just profess Jesus, but practically followed him out at work. These were the people that Daniel worked with. They tried to find a decision he made that would have cut a corner, but would have been better for business, and they couldn't find it. They said, man, he was a man of integrity. I don't know about you this morning, but I want when people look at my life, they know I'm not perfect by any means, but they say, that's a man of integrity. I pray that's truly your life, that you seek out not to just get the applause of man, but to get the applause of God, to be someone of integrity. To be someone that doesn't just profess Jesus, but walks out. And I love that they saw that about Daniel. They said, man, this guy, this guy Daniel, they couldn't find anything he did wrong. They could find no corruption in him. But they did find one thing. Here's what the Bible says in verse 5. It says, finally these men said, they will never, we will never find any basis for charge against this man unless it has something to do with the law of his God. He said, look, we can't find any corruption in him, but, but one thing we do see about him is that he's committed to God. I love that these men did not know God, but they saw Daniel was committed to him. Did you know people are watching and looking at your life? They might not know your Jesus or the God you serve, but I promise you that they can know that you serve him. 
I hope our life is a billboard and a testimony to show people I serve God. I'm committed to a lot of things. I'm passionate about a lot of things. But one thing you better, you better know for sure about me is I'm committed to God. Is anybody with me this morning? I love how they saw Daniel was committed to the law of his God. And so they knew if they were going to take Daniel down, it would have to do with his God. And so the Bible says that they come together and they begin to make this plan, this proposal they draw up that they're going to take to King Darius. And the proposal is this. If anyone prays to anybody, any God except for King Darius, for the next 30 days, you get tossed in the lion's den. Anybody prays to anybody but the king gets tossed in the den. This is their game plan to try to trap Daniel. And so the Bible says they take it to the king. And, of course, the king is godless and he's prideful and he loves himself. So this sounds awesome to King Darius. King Darius says absolutely. And the Bible says he signs the law. He signs it, and he signs it with the surrounding areas, which meant it was set in stone. Signed, sealed, delivered, no loopholes, no exceptions. Anyone that prays to anybody but King Darius for the next 30 days, you're going to the den. That's it. It's law. And then here's what the Bible says in verse 10. I love this. It says, now when Daniel had learned the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows were open towards Jerusalem. Three times a day he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God just as he had done before. (laughs) Evidently, Daniel didn't care. (laughs) Bible says he, he goes and he prays just as he had done before. And, of course, what he was doing was falling right into their trap. Of course, they catch him. They bring him before the king. The king loved Daniel. The king was about to promote Daniel. The king did not want to do it. It said that, His heart was grieved, but because of how the law was signed, there was no exceptions. And the Bible says that Daniel then, he gets tossed in the den. Tossed in the den. And the next day when he's brought out unharmed is where we read verse 23. It says, he was not harmed. No wound was found on him because he trusted his God. Trusted his God. I think there's a lot of things from this story we can learn about trusting God. The first one, I love in verse 10, how the Bible says, When Daniel learned the decree had been published. Okay, translation. When Daniel learned, if you pray, you're going to die. Translation. uh, When Daniel learned, if you walk in obedience here, it's probably going to be inconvenient for you. Translation. if, If you obey God right here, it's bad for business. He was about to get promoted. This was a good day. And if, if I'm Daniel, don't judge me because y'all are unspiritual too. I would have probably thought like, oh, it's just 30 days. I'll just worship for 30 days and I'll pray for forgiveness after. But I love that Daniel, when he had a decision to make, went with obedience. Here's what this shows me about trusting God. When you trust God, you obey him. When when you trust God, you obey him even when it's more convenient not to. When you trust God, you obey him when everyone else around you would say that's kind of ridiculous. When you trust God, you obey him when it's bad for business. When you trust God, you obey God. A lot of times trusting God doesn't look like the words you say, but it looks like the situations that you obey. That's a good tweet. Some of y'all need to tweet that. I'm going to say it again. Trusting God doesn't always look like words you say. It looks like situations where you obey. Daniel had a decision to make. Man, if I trust God right now, it's probably going to go bad. I know what the law says. I know what the penalty is. But I'm going to obey. I don't know how it's going to turn out. I don't get it. But because I trust God, I'm going to obey him. I'm going to obey him. And the Bible says, he gets down on his knees, and he prayed. Now, who, who's with me, though? When you take a step of faith, when you obey God against all odds, and when you obey God when it's hard and inconvenient and doesn't make sense, you don't do it believing for the worst. You do it believing God for the best. Is anybody with me? You do it believing that God is greater than your situation, that God is with you, that God has empowered you and anointed you to walk in obedience, and so you believe God for the best. Are you with me? But who's like me? You like to tell God how to come through for you. (laughs) 
Anybody do this? I'm like a planner, you know, I'm kind of like OCD sometimes, and so I like to have everything straight and know what's going on, and so I'm like, all right, God, I'm going to take a step of faith. God, I don't get it, but I'm going to do it, but by Tuesday at 3 o'clock, it's got to be handled. <laughs> Is anybody with me? You do this. You think about how God's going to come through for you. <laughs> so if, if I'm Daniel right here, if I'm being honest, if I'm Daniel, I'm probably like, okay, I have a decision to make. Will I obey or not? I'm going to obey, but I believe God's with me. I believe God's with me. I believe God's going to help me. And so I get down on my knees and I begin to pray. And my first thought, if I'm Daniel, is probably maybe God will blind the eyes of everyone around me and I won't get caught. So he begins to pray. Sure enough, boom, falls right into their trap. They come and they arrest Daniel. And if I'm Daniel, I'm probably like, come on, God. Come on. Has anybody thought this? Like, Lord, you're supposed to come through. Didn't happen. And so now I'm, I'm on the way to the palace and I'm, about to appear before the king, and my next thought is probably, all right, Lord, you've given me a great relationship with the king. The king loves me. You're going to give me favor right here, and I'm going to get off. <laughs> you guys know the story. Daniel appears before the king, and sure enough, the king, his heart was grieved. He loved Daniel. He didn't want Daniel to be killed. He was about to promote him, but because of the law, he had no power. His hands were tied, and so the Bible says now the king, king signs him away and gives the command, and Daniel is now getting tossed in the den. And if I'm Daniel right now, I'm probably like, really? <laughs> <laughs> like, like he, he didn't come through for me in, in my bedroom there. He, he, he didn't come through for me in the palace, and, and now I can hear the lions roaring, and, and I can smell their stank, and it's, it's just, it's a, all hope is lost, really, you know? But isn't it funny that it's in the lion's den where God chose to come through for Daniel? You know, sometimes God, he loves me and you enough to get us into the den so that we know we can really trust him. I would love it. Oh, my gosh. I would love it if God would rescue me in the bedroom. That would be really easy and convenient and happy. <laughs> I, I would love it if God would always come through for me in the king's palace. That would be nice, too, and much more convenient. But sometimes God will get you to the end of your rope, to the lion's den, to show you you, you can really trust him, man. See, here's what I've learned about trusting God is trusting God also includes trusting his timing. And how many know his timing is rarely, almost never our timing? But I'm so thankful that his ways are higher his thoughts are higher. His ways are greater. Listen, me and you don't need a God that is just like us. <laughs> we need a God that is greater and higher and sees what we don't. And we can trust him in that. I've found true joy isn't found in control. It's just found in trusting in a God that's higher and greater. His timing isn't our timing. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. But I know that his heart towards me is good and I can trust him. Trusting God means trusting his timing. I think that's a word for some of you in here. The season you're in is frustrating you. You feel like your wheels are spinning. You wanted to be somewhere where you're not. And the timeline God has you on is extremely frustrating. And I came here to say trust his timing today. Trust his timing today. Be faithful with where you are. Be faithful with what God has given you. And trust him to take you where he's taking you in his timing. <laughs> trust God in his timing. You know, if... A few years back, I was at American Family. You guys know this gym, you know? It's probably the last time I was at the gym <laughs> a few years ago. <laughs> it's terrible, Chris. Don't judge me, man. So, so I was there, and I'm in this weight room, and this, and, and this guy comes in. And, like, when I say this guy, I mean this guy. Like, his muscles had muscles that had muscles. Like, this dude, I'm like, bro, do you live here? Like, this <laughs> massive. Like, he could have ate me for an appetizer. Like, he comes in. He goes over to the inclined bench press. Like, like you guys can picture this, right? Inclined bench press where you're kind of lean back and the bar's over your head and you pull it off the rack and you bring it down to your chest and it, it works out your chest. And so this guy comes over, starts throwing weight on the inclined bench press. This is his warm-up, but it's like double my max already at this point. And he's throwing it through the ceiling like it's marshmallows. He's like, boo, you know, just crushing them, you know. Then he hops off and throws a bunch more weight on and keeps going. He's doing three or four sets and... After his fourth set, he has now used all of the weights at his station. They're all on the bar. And he begins to go, I'm not making this up, he begins to go to other people's stations and pull some of their weights off. And he keeps, I haven't touched a weight. I'm just watching. 
I'm like, this dude right here. I was like, does this make me stronger, like watching? <laughs> he's just crushing it, and he keeps going. And each set, I think he's going to be done, but he keeps adding a little more. And I'm not exaggerating. You guys are probably seeing this. The, the bar is, has a slight bend to it. I'm like, this dude right here, you know? And a bunch of people are starting to watch. It's kind of turning into a show. And this guy keeps going, keeps going, keeps going. And he finally, he's on the set, and he's getting all pumped up, shaking his arms out. And he pulls the bar down, and he brings it down to his chest, and it comes up, and then it just stops. <laughs> you, you know anything about weightlifting, when, when, when momentum has stopped, you're done. <laughs> done. Like, like, there's no such thing as a, come on, man, you got it. You know, like, no, you don't got it, you're done. Like, he had done so many sets at this point, and he's going, the weight is so much, I don't even know what it is, and it just stops. And you can see, like, sheer panic comes across his face. His eyes get big, and he's, like, looking around, like, somebody save me. I'm like, dude, I can't help you, bro. I can't help you. I'm going to pray. I'm like, Lord, save him. Lift the burden in Jesus' name. I can't do it. I'm sitting there. And, but, but what he didn't see was this trainer. This trainer from American Family had seen him. And when he was about to start that last set, the trainer had come around the room. And he was standing on the spotting rack. And as soon as momentum stopped, as soon as he was done, what the trainer did was the trainer just reached over and he picked up the bar and he put it on the rack for him. And of course the guy was, oh my gosh, man, thank you. You know, saved my life, you know, all this kind of stuff. And the whole time I'm sitting there looking at this, I'm like, man, this is, this is a picture a lot of times of our God, isn't it? <laughs> that, that like when the weight of life seems too much, when, when, like, when I, I don't really know a way out, when I seem powerless, when all hope seems lost, it seems like no help is around. We don't serve a God that is absent. We don't serve a God that is far off or incapable, but we serve a God that's right here, willing, able, and in his timing will lift up the burden and take it. This is our God. Come on, can I get an amen? Is anybody thankful for our God today? You can trust his timing in your life. You know, if I had to put in a single sentence that I, I want you to take away, if you, don't, if you don't take away anything else, here's what I want you to hear this morning. You, how do you know you can trust God? I, I know I can trust him today because God is faithful. Why don't you look at your neighbor, say faithful. Look at your other neighbor, say faithful. God is faithful. God is faithful. Did, did, did you hear me? God is faithful. One of my favorite scriptures in all the Bible is 2 Timothy 2.13. Here's what it says says, if we are faithless, okay, so if, if you leave here and just deny the Lord for the rest of your life, if, if you leave here and forget everything that Jesus ever did for you, and if, you, if your faith tank is on empty, it says if we're faithless, he remains faithful. He will remain faithful, for he cannot disown himself. Did you know God's faithfulness is not dependent on you? It's not dependent on your circumstance or your life. No, God is faithful. God has to be faithful because it's who he is. The Bible says if we're faithless, he will still be faithful because he cannot disown himself. Faithfulness is not just a hobby that God has practiced and gotten really good at. It's not just one of the characters. It's, it's who he is. It is impossible for God to not be faithful. How do I know I can trust him today? He's faithful. How do you know you can trust God today? Because our God is faithful. And because he's faithful, he cannot be anything but faithful to you. Did you hear me? Because he's faithful, he cannot be anything but faithful to you. His faithfulness is on your life. Not because you're awesome or you have your act together, but because that's who God is. It's who he is. I remember a few years ago when me and my wife, we got married. We've, we've been married for two and a half years now, so we're experts on all things marriage. <laughs> that was a joke. That was a joke. Um, me and her went to Tennessee on our honeymoon. We were so excited. We had, like, this cabin up in the Smoky Mountains. It was going to be so fun. And, and, like, we were looking up stuff to do and everything. And there's this tubing. You can go tubing down the river in the Smoky Mountains, you know. And we were like, that sounds cool, you know. And so we show up to go tubing and... The place is like a ghost town. There's like nobody there. 
And I'm like, I'm sure we just beat the rush, you know? <laughs> and so, like, we show up there, and, like, how it worked was you pay your money, and you get this tube. They throw you and your tubes in a van and drive you a few miles up the mountain to the river, drop you off, and then leave, and you have to come down the river back to your car. And so we were like, all right, you know, we were the only ones there, and it was about noon or 1 o'clock, so I was kind of wondering, like, why is nobody here? And on their way up, the guy tells us, oh, yeah, it's just snowing up at the top of the Smokies, so all the river is, like, ice and cold, you know, the snow melting coming down so I'm like praise the Lord <laughs> you know like this guy already has our money you know we might as well make you know so so he drops us off and just leaves and we're sitting there like okay and so I'm like it's probably not that cold you know and we like step in it's like bone chilling it's like ah and uh I don't know about you ladies but my wife hates being cold she hates being cold being cold is like like for her hell would be freezing not hot you know like she hates it she hates it and and so, like, we hop in, and it's freezing, and so I, 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 I'm, I'm a planner again, so I have this game plan. I'm like, all right, babe, like, like, it's only, like, a mile or two. Like, let's just hop in and, like, fly down the river. Let's just get this over with, and we can do something else fun, whatever. And so, like, I'm, I'm, like, ready to go. I'm ready to crush it. I'm ready to, like, fly through the rapids and just get done, you know, get out of the cold. And, uh, but she had other plans. She wanted to, like, hold on to my tube. <laughs> Ladies, you like, I want to be together. <laughs> I want to be with you, you know, and, so, you know, it's cool at some points, but, but, but then you get to, like, the rapids, and you start turning around backwards. I'm like, babe, let go. Like, 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 as soon as this rapid's over and it calms down, like, we come back to you, like, let go. Like, I'm heading towards a rock. Let go. Like, and, and literally, like, no, no. Like, she, she was glued. Like, she would not let go. Like, we, I was turning around backwards. My legs were all up, and she just, you know, like, and then for two miles, she would not let go. She was grabbed onto the handle of my tube, no matter which way I turned, no matter which rabbit came, no matter how, like, she was latched on. You know, because I'm, I'm going to tie this back into the scriptures, so bear with me. <laughs> Did you know the faithfulness of God is just latched onto your life? Man, it's just, it's, it's there. And again, it's not there because you're awesome or because you have your act together or because you perform well. It's there because it's who God is. God cannot, he cannot let go. His faithfulness cannot let go of your tube. God is latched on and through the rapids and through the turns and through the inconveniences. And sometimes when you think it would be better if he did not, God will and cannot let go. Because he's faithful. God is faithful today. And he, because he's faithful, he cannot be anything but faithful to you. It's all throughout the scriptures. I just want to toss a bunch to you really quickly. Exodus 34, it says this. The Lord, the Lord, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Deuteronomy 7 says, Know therefore the Lord your God is God. He is the faithful God. Deuteronomy 32 verse 4 says, The rock, his works are perfect. All his ways are just. He is a God of faithfulness. Psalm 26 verse 3 says, For I have always been mindful of your unfailing love and have lived in reliance on your faithfulness. Psalm 33 says, for the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. Psalm 36, 5 says, your love, O Lord, reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness to the skies. How many know God is faithful? If one scripture said it, it would be enough. But all throughout the entirety of scripture, you see God is faithful. God is faithful. Great is his faithfulness. He cannot be anything but faithful. God is faithful. Came here to remind you today. God's faithful. You can trust him because he's faithful. I'm going to ask the guys to come back up. Oh, man, you good, bro. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> come on, somebody. <laughs> Listen, the, the greatest example, please hear me, please hear me. The greatest example of the faithfulness of God is not Daniel chapter 6. It's a good one. It's not the best, or, it's not any other stories in the Old Testament. Actually, the, the greatest example of the faithfulness of God is the cross of Jesus. Listen, the, the cross, the cross is a picture of 2 Timothy 2.13. If, if we are faithless, he will remain faithful. Did you know, newsflash, you were faithless? The Bible says that you given the choice to choose to serve yourself or God, you chose yourself. I chose myself. The Bible calls it sin. We were faithless. 
We picked our way over God's way, and we've done it a lot. Yet he was still faithful to the cross. Look, the people that were beating and spitting on and cursing and mocking Jesus, faithless. He was faithful to the cross for them. Listen, if you ever begin to doubt the faithfulness of God in your life, look no farther than the cross. Some of you in here, I know, as I've been talking about God is faithful, you're thinking about your life and your circumstance and your family, and you're asking the question, how has God been faithful to me when this mess is going on? How is God faithful to me when he hasn't come through in years? How has God been faithful to me when I have not seen his hand in forever? And I came here today to fix your eyes off your situation and put it on the cross to say he has and he is faithful. Your greatest need is not money. It's not for God to come through in a great way. It's not for your promotion. All those things are great, but your greatest need is to have your sins forgiven. And me and you cannot be the forgiver of our own sins. And he has come through and he did it on the cross. He did it on the cross. Man, if you ever begin to doubt that he's faithful, look no farther than the cross where Jesus poured out his blood for people that were faithless, people that hated him, people that chose the world over him, people that chose bad relationships over him, people that chose sin over him. He was faithful to them, and he's faithful to you today. Here's what I want you to get. If, if we don't trust God, if, if you leave here and don't trust him, you don't obey He's still faithful to who he is, right? We've talked about this. But if you do trust him, if you do trust in a faithful God, his power will be displayed in your life. If, if you do trust in a faithful God, your life will become a billboard for the power of God. I want to show you what I'm, what I'm talking about. Daniel chapter 6, verse 25. After Daniel's been lifted from the den, here's what the Bible says in verse 25. It says, then King Darius, so remember, this is the king that is godless, the king that wrote a law saying, you can only pray to me. This is who's talking. It says, he wrote to all the nations and peoples of every language and all the earth. King Darius says, may you prosper greatly. I issue a decree that in every part of my kingdom, people must fear and reverence the God of Daniel. For he is the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will not be destroyed. His dominion will never end. He rescues and he saves. He performs signs and wonders in the heavens and on the earth. He has rescued Daniel from the power of the lions. I don't know about you, but I see this. And I'm like, what happened? <laughs> like literally, literally 20 verses prior to this, he's signing a law saying, you can only pray to me. 20 verses later, he's issuing a decree to everyone in the nation saying, Daniel's God is the living God. He endures forever. His kingdom will never end. And, and, and I see that, I'm like, what happened? He did not take a Sunday school class. He didn't hear a good sermon. He didn't come to a great church. He saw the power of God displayed in the life of Daniel who trusted him. Look, so who's ever seen that show? It's not on anymore. It used to be really popular. Extreme Makeover Home Edition. You guys know what I'm talking about that show. So the whole premise of that show, what they would do is they would find a family that's doing a great work in the community. And, but because of their home, it was either old or small or something. They were limited. So the show would send the family to Disney World. They would tear down their old house and build them this mansion that was customly designed to help them reach the community. It's it great. And so... They build this mansion up, and the whole community is there. Everybody's excited. The news cameras are there. And they bring the family back to see their new home. The streets are lined with thousands of people, and everybody's excited. And they drop the family off right in front of their new house. Everybody's screaming and yelling. But there's something between them and the house. What's that? The bus. There's a giant tour bus right there. And all of a sudden, everybody starts chanting, right? Move that bus. Move that bus. Move. Everybody starts chanting. The bus starts up, and then the bus slowly pulls away, and the giant mansion is revealed to the family. <laughs> Commercial break. <laughs> Every time. But what's funny is, you, 
you would think they would show the house, but they actually show the reactions of the family, and they're ridiculous, aren't they? <laughs> like you have the dad, he's trying to be like tough dude, but you, he, he really wants to cry, you know, you can tell. And then you have the mom, she's got a waterfall of makeup. <laughs> And then the kids are so pumped, they're screaming, they're like crowd surfing, like, that's my house, that's my house, you can come over, and you can come over. And they're just so excited, and the whole time, all of us were sitting at home watching, show me the house! <laughs> like, like, I'm sitting at home, and, and I'm watching the reactions, and because of the reactions, I want to see what they're looking at. Listen, when you trust in a faithful God, I'm telling you, our God will do a work in your life where people that do not know God or serve God, they will be able to look at your life and say, I want to know what he's looking at. What a beautiful opportunity we then have to share the good news of Jesus with others. Listen, I don't know about you. I want to trust him more today than I did yesterday. I want to trust them more next week than I did this week. And it's not because I have my act together. It's No, 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 it's, he's faithful. He's faithful. He's faithful. Would you stand up with me all over this morning? And